Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with Oscar Contreras. I'm so excited that he's here today. Oscar is a producer over at 1380 AM WBTK Radio, which is a Christian Latino station here in town. Um, he and his wife, Rachel, um, are involved with the crossover ministry. Um, his wife, although not Hispanic, is uh, fluent. Native. She's a Richmond native and she does some uh, translating work mm -hmm. for crossover. Um, so I'm going to just, we're going to do this kind of interview style. I'm going to ask Oscar some questions and then once we get warmed up, you all are going to ask him some questions. Please. Okay. Is uh, this working? Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Oscar, would you uh, just tell us about yourself, how long you've right. been in Richmond and uh, what you do professionally? Okay. In Richmond, I came in uh, like 2004 for, uh, to study photography and film in VCU. Uh, originally, um, when I first came to the United States, we, uh, my family and I came to uh, Culpeper County near Fredericksburg, and uh, so then I uh, moved here to, to come to uh, VCU for schooling, and uh, I met my wife uh, in 2006. We got married in 2008, and so I've been here since, since then. Uh, so it's been like six, seven years in, in Richmond area. And what is your country of origin? I'm from Guatemala, Central America. Uh, most of the time, Richmonders focus on whites and blacks when they talk about race in our region. Uh, would you tell us a little bit about the Latino community, specifically which countries are represented? Well, first, I, th I think it's a good, it's, it's, uh, it makes sense to be focused on black and white. Uh, when I came to the United States, I didn't know a lot of the history of black and white in, in, in the country. And, uh, as you explore it more, especially being in Richmond, I mean, it is just there. It's in, in, in your face, the, the history of black and white. So I think that needs to still be talked about, definitely, definitely. Uh, but uh, the world's moving so fast that you have so many people from different countries coming in now, especially in this area, uh, that we have to uh, be sensitive. And as Christians, we have such a great opportunity, like he was saying, God is with us all the time. His presence is with us all the time. So we can, uh, we can deal with these problems. We can deal with these issues because we have Christ in us. Um, with the Latino community, uh, we, I mean, from Mexico all the way down to Chile, is Spanish-speaking, you know, uh, countries. And from, from in, 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 uh, in Richmond, in the Richmond area, we have people from uh, all Central America, uh, Guatemala, uh, El Salvador, a lot of people in El Salvador. Uh, Colombia has been growing a lot too, Venezuela. Uh, Brazilian, which they're Portuguese speaking. Um, we have some people from Peru has been growing a lot too in the area. Uh, but also, some of the countries that, uh, like Central America, a lot of them in Mexico, they speak dialects, not just Spanish. So we've been getting a bunch of people from different regions that don't speak Spanish, they speak different dialects. And so when they come into the, to the country, not, not only do they have to learn how to speak Spanish, but they also have to learn how to speak English. So that's been a challenge within our own community uh, to, to serve them also. And uh, so it's extremely diverse. Um, we, even though we speak the same language, to per se Spanish, we have different ways of saying things, different ways of thinking, different types of music. Uh, a good example is just thinking about someone from Virginia and someone from uh, New York. You know, you, you may speak English, but you have certain differences, different accents, different ways of seeing life also. You know, so I think it's, it's, there's a lot of diversity within the, the Latino community. But what unites unite us is basically the, the language. You know. So when we think of the Latino community, and I'm guilty of this myself, I think kind of in a block, um, so the communities within um, the Latino community here in Richmond, are they generally um, cooperative or do they have their own tensions between them that they're working through as well as learning to adapt to the new culture? I think as, as uh, the immigration community, when they start being, uh, when they're a small, a small group, they definitely start working together because they, they find something in common. But as it grows and it grows, then you find your own people. You know, there's a lot more Guatemalans and a lot more uh, Puerto Ricans and a lot more Mexicans. So you kind of gather around your own people. And then it's a little more difficult to then start working together. Yeah. Um, here in Richmond, where do we find the largest concentrations of Latino neighborhoods? I think 
I think 10 years ago you could say the south, you know, south side of Richmond, but now it's uh, it's pretty much just the whole area. I mean, there's pretty much everywhere. Uh, the businesses, yes, the businesses are mainly in the south side, a lot of the businesses, but the community has moved just like any community where there are jobs, that's where people move. You know, where uh, it's safer for their families, that's where people move uh, according to what, you know, their, 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 um, uh, their means become better, they can move around a lot better. Okay. So I think it's pretty much just anywhere you find them, anywhere okay. and everywhere. Yeah. Um, I know that the, statistically looking at the census that there was a large growth um, in the Latino community in this area um, at the beginning of the century, at the beginning of the 2000s, about 200% uh, growth, growth in about five years, and then in the last five years about 90%, but still by far the, the fastest growing demographic in our region. And Can I mean, you Chester is the, 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 the um, county that has the largest growing population in Chesterfield. Okay. Um, What's bringing folks here? I, I, I think uh, just the, the jobs and also um, it's a, it's a, Virginia just overall is a nice place to, to bring your family, to grow, to have kids. And, and I think even, even Latinos from, that have been living in New York for a long time or California are coming to Virginia now. Because it's more expensive where they are, it's harder to raise their, uh, their families, basically, and then they're coming here. Now, other people from other countries that come straight to, to Richmond, I think they come because they have other family members. Uh, I don't think they come straight for work here. Usually they go to where there's a more farms and more other type of work, you know, like that. But um, I think the same, the same, the same needs as, uh, I mean, the same reasons why other people move. Basically, the, those places are more expensive or, or it's uh, more violence going on around and then they just come to this area that's more peaceful and, and friendly. Um, now I'll, I'll tell. I'm going to explain what Mercy Umbrella is to to Oscar. We talk about um, if there's something that's hard to say or we don't generally like to say in polite society, uh, that occasionally we can pull a Mercy Umbrella up and say, "Okay, I'm going to say this thing, and we're going to have a lot of grace between ourselves as believers." And so I want to extend to you a Mercy Umbrella and ask you to be um, just blunt and open with us about what stereotypes you feel white Richmonders might have about the Hispanic community? Well, you know, I was thinking about that question when you sent it to me, and I think, I want to hear, <laughs> I want to hear them. I want to... <laughs> <laughs> I want to put the, the grace umbrella on, <laughs> and I want you to tell me what those things are, and I can help maybe, you know, what do you think? <clears throat> Well, how do you see Latinos? Or I see the other thing is Latino Hispanic, which is uh, uh, even with Latinos. Uh, this is what I understand, and 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 also I mean with like African Americans. You know, some some of them like to be called black, African American. I mean, there's different ways, but I think it's all it's individuals. What you feel comfortable, and you have to go to that individual and say, hey, you just have that conversation with them. But Latinos is is uh, basically. A, a country or, or a group of people that are, their language is based on Latin. So you can say that uh, um, Italians are Lat Latinos because their, ba their language is Latin based. But Latin American then is people that speak Latin based languages in Latin America. But then Hispanics, just basically they, it, it doesn't include like Brazilians because Brazilians speak Portuguese, not Spanish. But then people just move, use those terms, you know, how are they, or whichever. Do you have a preference? Mm, no. No, okay. No. Not All right. Any, not anymore. <laughs> like so the question is uh, in the room. Anyone want to, to speak to it? You don't have to own this particular yeah. feeling, but it's something that you believe is felt in our community. Yes. Identify yourself, please. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Al. My perception. I don't know if that's actually true. We have the same kinds of issues with abortions in the current household and so forth as just the society as far as the world is going to be. 
Okay. What I found out, and, and again, it, it really depends on, if you think about the immigration, I mean, if, if you have a family that has been here for so long, they will, they will change, the, the views will change too. So, or a family that has just come recently to the United States a year ago, it's gonna be a whole different family. Uh, or somebody that has been here for 20, 30, 40 years, you have current children, it changes. But, but generally speaking, yes. I mean, uh, we like to stay more connected with our family. We believe in that, you know, the grandmother, the, the, whole, the whole structure of cousins and nephews and, and stuff like that. And what I found out here, yes, in, in the United States, you do have that more individ, individ, individuality aspect. And that in, in Latin America is more a community feeling, yes, where neighbors know you. And I think maybe back in the, I don't know, 50s, 60s in this country, and that's kind of the way it was. Uh, neighbors knew you, you knew their na neighbors, the, uh, they took care of your kids, you, you, know, you kind of kept that community feeling. And I think Latinos still have that community feeling. Uh, I grew up in the New York City area, and uh, I was a teenager with a sex story. Yeah. I can't do that. <laughs> no, but uh, I think you, you weren't any Hispanic in the area that I grew up in, but it's not the fear of the language uh, that image of the sex story that I felt uh, by itself. So, yeah, I think a lot of people fear the fact that Um, again, like I was telling you, some of the, even, even me when I came to, to, uh, to the United States and I encountered all the different, all the different nationalities from, you know, all these people that spoke Spanish, but I couldn't sometimes understand what they were saying. So Mexicans, they would say something, I would be like, what is that? So I still had some trouble. And then I also sensibilizing myself was saying that there are some people that don't even speak Spanish that they have trouble speaking Spanish, but they're Latinos. I mean, they're from my country, but they don't speak the language. So I think, um, I think we can all communicate. I think we, um, we can see it as a barrier, or we can see it as an opportunity to communicate. Um, I mean, you, there's, a, there's a game where you, where you uh, mimic stuff, you know, when you say, yeah. So basically, you can communicate if you really want to communicate with somebody. I think there's a point where you, you just don't want to. You're just saying, I can't. I am not gonna understand what you're saying, and, and that's it. And you block. But if you say, let me try to understand you, then it'll be a point that you will understand each other. I think it's, uh, it's going that extra mile and that extra step and, put, and, and letting yourself be uncomfortable and, and letting yourself be silly and, and you know, for the sake of, of peace and communication with, with others. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll partially on this one. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I think you got distracted. Uh, so the perception is uh, for, uh, for how people uh, uh, perceive the income or let's say like the city of the bank in general, are that these are hard-working people that uh, will work for practically nothing. Okay. And it's uh, minimum wage. Uh, and that's the perception. Uh, and that may be true of those who want to work for nothing. I'll just say it's very exciting. Uh, however, you know, you mentioned it earlier, Maybe come with higher expectations, uh, a higher standard of living, 
-hmm. Yeah. Yes. No, that's a good question. No, definitely. Uh, I think again. I I think that in any situation, an immigrant really comes to. Um, Obviously, if they're leaving their home, nobody wants to leave their homeland on their home and their family. Nobody wants to do that. No matter where, in each, whatever country or each state. I mean, nobody wants to leave what they know. So if they're going to make the choice of leaving that place, it's because they pretty much have to. Of course, there's, there's many, many other reasons why people might leave their country. But generally speaking, it's because they really have to, to support family back home or, or to make a, just to have what everybody wants, a home, a family, a job, and just, you know, just stuff like that. Um, here, there are people that haven't finished school or they've never been in school before in their lives. They always work with their hands, their hands. So they come here and they do, I mean, whatever they, you know, I just do it. I just need money, you know, I, I need it. So they do whatever they need to do. There's people here that, uh, that have come here with actual uh, degrees. On, but they don't speak the language. They couldn't practice their, 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 uh, their profession back home. And so they come here and they're actually doing the same thing. They're, they're uh, getting whatever job they can. Because that's, so you have people that are unschooled and people that have degrees cleaning homes together. Um, now the person that has a degree has, you know, their mind is different, so they will probably search for different, more re they're, they're better at getting resources because they're just used to it. And so they might go up the ladder faster and then they just, then they, they say, no, I'm gonna do this job for this amount of money because now they know that they can do that. But um, I think in the beginning is whatever you can get, you're gonna get, yeah. And, and if it's, and, and if they offer you this much and you compare it, because when I first came to the United States, you compared the money with the money back home. And let's say they say, I'm gonna give you $100 if you do this. And you think $100 is 700, 700 quetzales in my country. I will never make this much money. So you compare and you say, oh, definitely. And, but you don't know that you're supposed to be charging 250. Because you don't think like that, you don't, you don't know. You think $100, that's a lot of money. I will never make this much money in, two, in a week. And I'm making it in a day. Great. So. Um, the stereotype that um, all the Latinos are from Mexico, and that they're all here to be legal, and that they're taking their jobs. Well, I just say they're not all from Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> And that's something that when, also when I first came, the first, some people will come up to me and they're, where, uh, where in Mexico are you from? Just like that, and I'm like, mm, no, I'm not from Mexico. So that's, if, if there's something that, just don't do that. <laughs> just, don't, just don't assume, don't say that you're from Mexico. It's just, even Mexicans feel offended by it because they know, <laughs> because they know you're doing it, because they know you're doing it in a generalized way. You know, they get upset. I mean, it's, it's just, it's like me saying, oh, where, where, are you from Canada? Where from Canada are you from? Just, you know, you just, you don't do that, you know. Um, and I forgot, I forgot the rest of your question. Yes, um, so yes, I've got, uh, illegal immigration, it is definitely a, a, a reality. Um, Percentage-wise, percentage it is difficult to tell, um, and also, my father came here illegally in 86, no, 80, 85, I think, the first time that he came. And, and he didn't like it. He went back. He's like, I'm not going to make it. I don't, I don't like it. I go back to my family. He got a job back, you know, back home, and he was fine. And, and uh, they called him back. They really wanted him to come back and work for this person. And because they couldn't find somebody to do what he was doing, I don't know. I don't know what the situation was, but he came here illegally. And uh, um, I mean, he didn't, he didn't want to. I, I, don't, I don't think they, they realize, a lot of people don't realize that it is, they're, they're breaking the law. I don't, they don't realize it because it's they, they, they think um, that they're doing something right for their family. I, you know, I, 
I cannot talk for my dad, but um, in 86, you all know that there was an amnesty and he was able to apply for, uh, for a residency and, and so on and so forth. And, and we were still back home, my family and I, and it took 10 years for him to, uh, to get us together. So he was gone for 10 years completely. Mm -hmm. He was in uh, Madison, Madison County, uh, farming. Mm -hmm. um, so basically we were separated for 10 years. So the, the thing is then, somebody comes here, my dad was, you know, he was blessed by having that opportunity. Otherwise I think he probably would have come back home. I don't think he would have stayed longer than, than that. But uh, some people that come, I see that they're pretty much, I don't know if this is the word, but they're, they're stuck here because to come here, they have to spend a lot of money to come to this country. They have to pay a lot of money. So let's say a, a, a let's say ten thousand dollars. But I know it's a lot more than that sometimes. But it's, let's say they spend ten thousand dollars. They have no money, but they raise the money. They ask for family members to, to you know, borrow money, and so they spend ten thousand dollars to to make it here. They don't realize how the system is here. I mean, in the United States, you have so many bills. I mean, my goodness, you pay for so many things. So many things. So when they get here, they don't realize that they have to pay this and this and this, plus they have to pay. And all the money that they're making goes into paying that, plus they have to pay the, the, the debt that they have over there. And they don't want to go back home with a huge debt. So they have to stay here longer. And so it's, a, it's this mess. It's this mess that they just can't get out of. Um, and a lot are in that situation where they just get and then, then you go and they fall in love with somebody else, and then, and then they get married, and then they have children, and you're gonna tell them not to do that. I mean, they, then they have children, and then you're like, I, I don't want to bring my child to over there. They don't know, and it's just, it's just really a mess. It's a mess that people get into, and it's just that the politics and society makes pushes people to to be in those types of situations. I think I don't know. A really good question. I, I'll get back to you in just a second. I wanted to just follow up on that because I had the opportunity to hear Oscar speak at an Immigration and the Kingdom of God forum recently. And one of the things that came out of that that was really interesting and new to me was um, what happens for these families and individuals um, if they are here illegally um, and having to live under the radar, they're not only living under the radar, they're living without the protection of law. And uh, one of the things that surprised me and has really touched my heart is thinking about what happens then if there's abuse in a family or if um, a worker is being treated unfairly, if there's been violence done against the family and they can't, they, they no longer afforded what we would consider the protection of the law because of their status. Um, I got a note this week from Brenda here in our class who said, um, this week's topic is near and dear to my heart. I've served for the last 10 years um, with this uh, community um, and she's grown close to many of the families and she said, uh, the consequence of being here illegally has hit close to home the last two years as my children have had their families torn apart. The latest, even just two weeks ago, when a mom was taken by four black SUVs at the break of dawn, leaving a husband who needs to work and three young children, all of whom are here legally. Um, I'm watching and praying as the extended family tries to assist um, in the domino effect this is having on others. No matter what our political opinions uh, the, on the human level, this is really painful. And I appreciated uh, Brenda sending that to me, I think it's a great reminder that there are policy discussions and there are people discussions. Um, so mm -hmm. we can get back to the illegal immigration conversation if you want. Other any other stereotypes you want to bring up before we move on? Yes, sorry. Either of you. Go ahead. You better stand up and introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, it's well. I, I <clears throat> before I was Christian and back home, the the Catholic Church is the big um, like every, if I don't know how to say it. Um, they're not they're not Catholic, but they just 
just if you ask them they might say I'm Catholic just to say it you know what I mean just by culture um, in the United States you ask somebody are you Christian and they might say yes I'm Christian but it's a cultural thing that they're saying I'm Christian because they probably are not you know so I think it's just that it's a cultural thing that they if you don't participate in any active church they just gonna say I'm, I'm Catholic because they might go to a, a, a wedding of a friend, a baptism of a child, and they just say, yes, I'm, I'm Catholic. So, um, but um, again, uh, I don't know what, in what year the missionaries started going to, to my part of the, you know, in Central America, a lot of missionaries from the United States started going to, to Guatemala and, 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 and Salvador and all those, uh, Mexico. And, and I think a lot of the Protestant movement has definitely grown a lot. Uh, a lot of Pentecostals, I think, uh, Central American Pentecostals, are now in, in Richmond. A lot of churches that are Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. Hola. I worked in uh, social services when I in back in Culpeper County, and I and I worked with the city city of Richmond Hispanic Liaison Office too, and uh, so I was in, in and so I did intake and I knew all the little process you know to get all the, the the benefits and stuff. They just can't. I mean, you need to have a social security number, and they do check it. So if it's if it's stolen or if it's if they don't, you don't have one, then you don't just don't get the benefits. So if you're here undocumented you can't get any benefits. When they will come to me in social services and they come with this, this need, the only thing I could refer them to was a church to get food and get clothing. Even if it wasn't their need, it's like that's the only thing I can offer you, food and clothing. I cannot, you cannot do anything through the government, through social services. Um, and sometimes they will have three kids that were uh, undocumented and one child that was born here. Well, you know, if you have it, that child can get the benefits, but the other three kids, they can't. So, yeah, you just can't do it. You can't. It, it is a miss. I don't know how. I don't know how that came to be. I don't know how people think that they can get benefits. I just don't understand it. When I, when I, also when I came to the United States and uh, we became uh, uh, residents. They told us for two years, I don't know what the law is now, but for two years you cannot get any benefits from, from uh, the government. So you, could, you have to sustain yourself for, for those two years, and then if you need it, then you could, you could get them. But um, a, a lot of Latino families, a lot of immigrant families, they try not to do that because it's a pride thing. They, don't, they really don't want to do it. Uh, and, and but then they, they fall into you know you, you got a low jobs and then you really have to you know there's no other way to, to get around it but um, yeah you can't if you're undocumented you just can't get any benefits from the government you just can't do it you have to go to a nonprofit that doesn't get money from the government to <laughs> because if you get money from the government then the government requires certain paperwork so then you can't get the services. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and 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 go
Um, with immigration being such a hot topic, especially during last year, sometimes we're led to believe that um, immigrants have come here legally over the past 40, 50 years. The process that they follow, that they have actually a more harsh outlook on people that are coming here illegally than uh, white Americans. I don't. I don't think so. Yeah, there's. There's. I mean, there's. There's gonna be people that are gonna speak out and probably say that they have that opinion. Um, I think if if you understand, if if you tr if you try to understand why they make certain people make certain certain decisions, whether it be coming to this country or any other decision, uh, everybody has a history and a, and a past and, and a reason why they make that decision and and. When I see those families, I wish they. I mean, I even I even tell some of those those uh, those parents that are here. I tell them, you know, if you don't if you don't have to be here, go back with your kids because I went through that. I went to my dad. You know, I mean, I don't care what the situation was, but of course, as a dad, you don't think that you think I have to provide. I have to provide somehow. But I tell them, if you don't have to be here, just go back. I mean, it's not easy. And then and then putting the family together again. It's still a struggle because I didn't have a dad for 10 years. My mom didn't have a husband for 10 years. It's, it's a mess. So it is, it is a struggle. You don't, no, nobody wants to go through that. And I think if you understand those situations, then, then I don't think you're going to be harsh on those people. It's just, you just know that they made some choices that they might be wrong or, or right, but um, uh, you know, they're just trying to, to do what they think is best. So I don't. Maybe there's some a group of people that think like that. Uh, the majority that I spoke spoken to, I mean, they're sensitive to to why they make th those choices. And again, going back to the policy making, the the, uh, the politics and and the relationships between countries and countries. I mean, all those things. I mean, people that have um, you know they're, they're the leaders of it, the country. They have their own agendas, and they don't see how it affects the everyday people. You know. I have this impression that they are taking advantage of the opposition to that actor that Again, I think it depends on, I mean, it really depends. Um, but I personally have heard and, and I personally have worked with some people that have been taken advantage of. Uh, I remember my, one of my, my brother-in-law, he went to work for, a, for just, you know, somebody needed, needed a, a construction helper and uh, him and somebody else went. He, he worked for the whole day and uh, he wanted to pay him with a bag of potatoes. And he's like, okay. Um, and those things happen, then you don't know what to say. I mean, you're an immigrant, this is not your country, this is not your place. To so just step away and just hopefully somebody else will come and give you a job, you know. So people do take advantage of, of the situation, definitely they, they, they will. Um, but there's other people that definitely take, take those families in, in, in their win and they, they help them out as much as they can, you know, and, and they pay the right payment for their job and, and et cetera. But uh, another example was, uh, uh, again, the, the payment. They work two, three days, and, and, and uh, then they write a check, and they in the memo, they put void. They, don't, they go to the bank because they got the check and say, I'm sorry, sir, but you cannot cash this check, it's void. And so things like that do happen. They do happen. So. So what you do? You you don't go and make a big deal out of it. Again, going back to the, you're not gonna go and run to the police and say, hey, they, because they're again, like you were saying, they're under the radar. You don't, you know, like, uh, and so they're afraid of stepping out and doing this. So those people that have bad intentions, they keep doing it over and over and over again because their 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 target is a weak target. You know, when they when they target an elderly people, same thing. And, you know, they find somebody that they can target on, and they just keep doing it until somebody speaks out and says something. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I mean, there, there definitely is. I mean, I think the churches have a, a lot to. They could do a lot more, not just for the Latino, just overall for the week. I mean, that we could do so much more. Uh, I think this is the place. That, the church is the place that we can have these conversations and not say, well, whatever they made a decision, you know, like, you know, with, with them, we we, we, uh, we we can be more sensitive. We can be. Uh, um, um, graceful. I mean, we have that freedom to be graceful and to be helpful and to be kind. We have that freedom to do so. The world doesn't have that freedom. They, they quickly accuse and say, well, you did that. You did that to yourself. You get out of that yourself. So, but we have the freedom to say, I want to help you. You know, so, so I, I, I think there is a place, but that place we're not doing, we're not doing, we're not doing the, the, the job that we need to do as a church. I think that's the only place that we're going to find real, real help and real solutions. Uh, because the government can't do it until they change policies. I mean, that's the thing when you make something, and we're talking about mainly legal immigration, but when you make something illegal, uh, like something like this, uh, some, it, it's basically a, a law that can be changed. You know, once it's not illegal, then it's okay. So it's, it, as, a, as a nation, you do have illegal, illegal, legal, but as a, as, as a human, you should have a higher, as a Christian, you should have a higher law that tells you what's right and what's wrong. And you should go by that, first of all. And you should question that with God. You know, how, how should I act on this? Even though the world, the law says this, I mean, what do you tell me to do? What, what is my role? I think that we have that freedom to do that, and that's great, you know, that we can do that. We can go against what the world does. We can do that, so. Uh, I yeah. start, we'll kind of work our way through. You know, we need to do specific things. I mean, obviously, we need to go to the right thing. We need to do specific things that you can recommend to us. I think you, you were talking about communication. If you just say hello and smile to somebody, that's going to make the biggest difference. It really will. Specific things. specific things. Uh, just, I think just be inviting and open and don't be afraid. Because we do, I mean, if it's the unknown, we do feel afraid. And we don't want to cause people to be uncomfortable. But I think if our intentions are right, in the right place, then we leave the, we leave the consequences to God, you know. Um, and, and, and going back to the black and white, you do have that experience already trying to get two communities together and how shaking somebody's hand was a big deal or, or letting, letting them come and work with you or, you know, back then, blacks and whites, I mean, that's basically the same, pretty much the same thing where you just open your heart and just accept them, accept them and uh, try to make a place in your, in your heart first and then in your community for them. Susan, we'll just work our way around. Yes. Yes. There's there's a there's tension definitely, um, and I think I mean they call us minorities, but of course if I don't think we're minorities uh, because if we put them together, there's a lot more more of the minorities than the majority, but. <laughs> <laughs> But when you use, when you keep repeating words and messages in the media, that becomes the the truth. So, and then we, as minorities, adopt it. We take it in and we say that's what we are, and that's where we're supposed to be. And so, I think with blacks and Latinos, I think we've we've accepted what the media and the the majority of people say to be truths. And so we end up believing it and living it, you know. Kind of when Christ tells us that we're, when Christ tells us the truth, we have to believe it and live it. So when the world tells us the truth and we believe it and live it, then we're really in a big trouble. So I, so I think that's where the attention is. In a, a quick story, when I, again, when I first came here, one of the first things that they told me was be careful with the blacks. And I was 12, 13 years old, and I'm, I didn't understand what's going on. You know, I, didn't, I didn't know what the deal was. And don't even say the word 
in, in Spanish, black is negro. So it's, it's very close to negro or, and so they say, don't say, don't say, no, don't even say the word negro. Don't even say like, oh, my black shoes, I couldn't even say, I, I felt afraid of saying mis zapatos negros, if there were black people around me. So I would automatically act differently when there was black people around me. I would be like, you know, kind of like, just look around and, so, yes, there's tension, but, but uh, it's because of what we hear and what we accept. Once we start realizing how much, we, especially the black community and, and the Latino community, we have so much in common. Most of our, most of our uh, um, customs are from very, very African descent uh, customs. The music, the food is very influential by the African uh, culture. So, and the family structure is so similar. Uh, the, 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 the way we see life is very similar too, but unless those people sit down and talk about it, we won't know it. Yeah. But there is a lot of tension, definitely, yeah. Like, I mean, he will mention about the prayer going around and not really realizing who and your neighbor. Maybe you know them, but you don't know their needs. You don't know them. Uh, just give me you a chance to, but um, chance to get to know them. Um, wh where I work, 1380 AM, we have Spanish and English programming together, and we are hoping that that's gonna. This uh, more uh, African American. Um, uh, gospel kind of kind of programming that we have in English and then we have the Latino uh, programming and we're hoping that that's gonna help somehow um. yeah I, I want to um, oh they, they were waiting for a while oh I, okay okay let me speak really quickly to when um, we had the immigration forum Oscar was saying that one of the things he feels God has called him to is to be a bridge builder between the um, Latino churches and white churches and he in fact attends a church that has a Latino congregation that meets in the building a white congregation that meets in the building and sometimes they do things together but not as much as your heart would like <laughs> yeah and so this is this is an ongoing conversation I'm sorry we're yes um, <laughs> right I'm not good at this I'm sorry <laughs> Mm. 
Well, that's something that I, I even I, I even uh, uh, was a shock for me to find out as as living in the United States, uh, <clears throat> the whole Republican and Democrat. It's it's, it's uh, I'm sorry, but it, it's just horrible. <laughs> it's uh, I don't I don't I don't I don't get either either parties how they 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 just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like if you're Republican, this I mean, you know, you're you're the you're Christian. That's it, you know. You're Democrat, you're probably not, you know. And then and uh I mean, Democrat, Democrat you probably and and the points of yeah, it's just a mess. I don't know. Um but definitely people people are going to think that. You know, you're you're a newcomer to the country. That's if you know that's what you get. So you're quickly gonna say you're you're white. You go to you're a churchgoer. You're Republican. You don't like immigrants. No, 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 no. no. Okay. All right. I'm gonna ask Oscar to close us in prayer in Spanish, if you would, and uh, and then we're gonna then you guys gotta go faster. I'm in trouble. <laughs> Well, we can do we can do a short a short first of all thank you so much I'm gonna do it in, I'm gonna do it in Spanish too but you understand both so that's fine <laughs> thank you so much for this opportunity thank you for opening the doors for, to have these conversations and uh, I'll just ask you to uh, to to give us the freedom to be uh, the Christians that you want us to be with, without fears and, and realizing that life is so short that we may have 20 years more or 10 years or 30 years more in this, or in this, uh, in this world but we may have only a few hours left uh, one day left uh, we don't know so but help us live one day at a time and, and with no fears of, of sharing your love and your grace that you've shared with us Gracias Señor por por tu amor y por porque siempre abres las puertas para que para que tu gente aprenda más de ti y podamos uh, compartir ese amor que tú nos das con, con los demás bendice a esta iglesia bendice a la iglesia de Sony Point en este lugar bendice la grandemente en el nombre de ti hijo Jesús amén Thank you. Thank you.